And let's get started. Okay, um, for those who haven't been here last time and don't know me, I'm Renzo. I'm a visiting fellow postdoc Erda, um, working for Peter Banditini. And today my title is Layer-Specific FMRI. And Peter um, asked us to focus on the limits of our respective fields. So I will talk for most of the talk about the uh, limits, specifically the limits that I'm struggling with. And only show a bit of like the motivation at the beginning and some of the exciting applications. So about uh, motivation, you know that neuroscience bridges a lot of different spatial regimes. From the microscopic side, we have like the synapses, the neurons, up to the macroscopic side where there is behavior, the manifestations of mental disorders or the activity across the different brain areas. It's only this mesoscopic part here that is kind of underrepresented. And both sides of this bridge are getting closer and closer to each other with newer methodology. For example, with these new optogenetics methods, you can measure hundreds and thousands of neurons at the same time. And also with higher resolution fMRI, you do not only investigate the activity across the brain areas, but also the activity within those brain areas. And I believe the keystone that will bring everything together and make this bridge stable is the spatial regime of these few hundred micrometers, where we have these basic neural building blocks of the cortical columns and layers. And to get there, I'm really willing to make compromises. So I don't really care yet if it's not a whole brain method or if the TR is bigger than three seconds or so. I think we should first try close the bridge and then as soon as it's stable, we can build on top of that. And the reason why I'm so fascinated about these layers and columns is because they open up a whole new level and whole new window in, to investigate brain systems. So you know that the brain consists of all these different areas and a lot of them are organized in a strictly hierarchical fashion, in the sense that when this brain area gets bottom-up, feed-forward input from another brain area that is lower in the hierarchy, this input mostly comes into the middle layers. Whereas the same brain area receives feedback input from another brain area that is higher in the hierarchy into the upper layers. So by knowing at which layer the activity occurs, we have a new kind of information. We not only know if the area is involved in a certain task, but we also kind of know where this activity is coming from. And obviously not the entire brain is strictly hierarchically organized, um, especially in the frontal areas, there are other layer models that uh, are more appropriate. For example, this input-output model, like I will talk about examples in DLPFC or the primary motor cortex. And in a motor cortex specifically, like when you do any movement task, it's the cortical cortical input from, for example, the sensory cortex that comes in here, or the cortical cortical input from motor planning areas, premotor cortex that comes in here, it's integrated, and then the output originates from these feedback loops down there. So the cortical spinal output that eventually triggers the muscles to move originates down here. And we can then try to see, if we can see this with high resolution fMRI, by manipulating the different input and output characteristics. So for example, in this study here, we used four different movement tasks. In the blue condition, the people like, did a finger tapping like that, a finger movement with touch. And for this kind of task, we would expect both strong input and strong output activity. So we kind of do see, I think you can see it here, that there's strong activity in the upper layers and deeper layers, also visible as two blue peaks here when you plot the signal as a function of cortical depth. And then we can try to minimize or reduce this uh, feedback, cortical cortical input, by doing the same movement, but without the touching part, or even a clearer, doing just the touching, in the black case here, without any movement. And for this kind of a task, we see that it's only the upper layers in a motor cortex that are receiving this input, and there is no output at all. If so, it rather seems to be like an inhibitory output. And we can even completely invert that by doing the tapping with the other hand. And we did those experiments with a blood volume contrast and with this conventional gradient echo bold. And you can see that it's somewhat clearer in the blood volume contrast, whereas bold has these huge biases towards the, the, um, the upper cortical layers. And I will talk about that more later. People are also doing layer-dependent fMRI in the visual cortex. And for example, Lars Muckley is looking at the decodability across the different cortical depths. So he shows his participants these um, 
images um, of different classes, and he has these occluded areas, for example, at the bottom right over here. And the part of the primary visual cortex that is responsible for um, um, representing these bottom right parts here um, does not get any feed forward input from the eyes or the thalamus. It must be coming from feedback input from higher um, order area sending feedback. And Lars Muckley sees that the decodability of the um, image categories is actually higher in the upper layer, suggesting that this is the feedback coming in, in the upper layers. A very similar study or similar and different study from Peter Cox, um, Cox also looking at the primary visual cortex, looked at these Canisa triangles, where you kind of believe you see something um, in one area. However, there's actually no feed forward input. And Peter Koch finds that it's actually the deeper layers that send this input. So those studies don't really confirm each other. But the task is not identical and, and certainly not the analysis method. And quite recently, uh, Lawrence et al. Um, looked at uh, working memory in the primary visual cortex and asked people to like maintain and memorize specific orientation gradings. And they find that it's both the upper and deeper layers that seem to be sending the feedback. People are also doing layer-dependent fMRI in the auditory cortex. And we know that in the auditory cortex, there is this kind of topical distribution of that representation. So for example, uh, high pitch tones are represented somewhere here, and lower pitch tones are represented somewhere here, and there's this gradient. And Federico De Martini in, uh, investigated those uh, tone, uh, these, uh, like the tuning width of certain auditory frequencies across the different cortical depths. And he found that the tuning width is sharper in the upper layers when the person attends the task better compared to the deeper layers, which seem to be independently um, unsharp if you attend or not. Layer fMRI can also be done in the primary sensory cortex. And this is a recently concluded study here from NIH in collaboration with Yinghua uh, Yin Yu. And in the primary sensory cortex, we were particularly investigated, uh, interested in this part over here that represents the index finger. And we know in the primary sensory cortex that it's the feed forward input that comes into the middle layers. Like for example, the input from thalamus when you're feeling something like a touch sensation. Whereas the feedback input mostly comes into the upper layers. For example, the corticocortical input when you anticipate a task or, or expect to be touched without actually being touched. And we try to engage these different input um, pathways differently by using different touching tasks. So we use these 3D printed piano key like devices where participants inside the scanner learn specific sequences of being touched. And they were asked to always predict which finger is going to be touched next. And Ying Hua, who was inside the scanner while I was scanning outside, um, touched the person's fingers, for example, in this order of pinky finger, ring finger, middle finger, index finger. And in some instances, she left out the index finger. And those were the interesting cases, because in those cases, there was actually no feed forward input, only feedback expectation input. And as a control condition, she did a different touching sequence where the fingers were touched in a completely random fashion. So the participant could not predict which finger is going to be touched next. However, there was some feed forward input coming in from the thalamus. And the kind of predicted feed forward and feedback mechanisms is exactly what we see in this tiny part of the primary sensory cortex, where we see that for the green condition, the feed forward condition, it's mostly the middle or deeper layers, whereas for the feedback condition, it's almost exclusively the upper layers, maybe even clearer visible in these group results, specifically for blood volume, where you can see these peak in the upper layers for the blue feedback condition and in the deeper layers for the feed forward condition. Another interesting brain area to do layer-dependent fMRI in is the dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex, which I'm quite excited about. And it is kind of weird in the sense that it's um, very convoluted and it looks very different in every uh, participant. However, we uh, kind of um, know which kind of layer-dependent uh, pattern to expect here. So for monkeys, we know that it's the upper layers that receive a lot of corticocortical input and, and and maintain information, whereas the deeper layers are the ones that send output, for example, when the monkey needs to do a saccade. 
and my collaborator here, Emily Finn, she came up with a very nifty task to engage these different layers differently. So she uses this task of showing participants specific strings of letters, like a string of letter of W, D, H, V, X. And uh, participants see these strings of letters only for like a second and then need to memorize it. And after like 20 seconds, and we asked at which position was the W. And if they remembered and maintained it correctly in their upper layers, then they would press button one in this case. The more interesting part of this experiment, however, then occurs when they are not only maintaining this information, but um, also need to manipulate it. For example, they see the strings of letters and they are asked to sort these letters according to the alphabet. So then it would be not W, D, H, V, X, it would be D, H, W, V, X. And then the W would be in the third position. And we see, after applying a bit of smoothing within layers here, that it's really mostly the upper layers that are responsible for these alphabetization uh, information manipulation conditions. Whereas, for example, it's mostly the deeper layers in red here that are responsible for sending the output, which might be clearer visible looking also at the group results of the time courses here. We can see that the Upper layers in green, they really shoot up as soon as the person needs to do this manipulation and the alphabetization. And as soon as the person found a result, it goes back to baseline. And this is very different for the deeper layer, which is, doesn't really care about this alphabetization, but it shoots up as soon as the person found a result and the output needs to be sent. Since Peter asked us to talk about the limits this summer, um, I want to spend the rest of the talk talking about the uh, limits of, of uh, layer-dependent fMRI. Specifically, I want to talk about those limits. And it has become a kind of contradictory part of my life that I um, try to make people excited about layer fMRI only to disappoint them later on in, in, in describing how messy it is. And I have been and maybe not accused. I, people told me that I make it sound so simple, but then that the scanner is actually quite messy. So I want to, I want to talk about the messy part for the rest of the talk. Specifically, I, first I want to talk about the localization specificity limitations, which is quite frustrating in a sense that um, it means that the voxel size is kind of getting independent of the effective resolution. And it doesn't only help like, to just increase the voxel size. So going from three millimeter to two millimeter, one millimeter and 0.7 millimeter fMRI voxel, we still end up with these kind of fuzzy blobs. And now we just have these fuzzy blobs at high resolution. And we know that um, where this is coming from, it's basically coming from the fact that a conventional gradient echo bold fMRI signal is mostly coming from these oxygenation changes in the large straining veins, which are not as nicely laminar aligned like the neurons are. So most of the oxygenation changes are actually happening in these like layer unspecific diving or peel veins. So in some sense, using gradient echo bold for layer fMRI is comparable as using CO2 emission mapping as a measure of industrial activity, which might work very well to like compare the big structures like the different brain areas or the different countries in this metaphor or even different cities and state might work. However, it certainly breaks down as soon as you approach the spatial regime of the training infrastructure. So you can obviously not use the overall CO2 emission of that voxel as an indication of the activity in a certain shop here because most of the CO2 emission in that voxel obviously refers to um, activity in other shops somewhere else. And this limitation of gradient echo bold is well known and described since the advent of fMRI like more than 20 years ago. And there are a lot of alternative methods proposed to um, have a better localization specificity. And one of my favorite methods is this blood volume sensitive vaso method, which is believed to be more specific to the microvessels that are closer to the laminar aligned neuron structures. So in this sense, we would still be sensitive to the streets, but maybe the smaller locally specific streets. And VASO is actually only one of multiple um, candidates that are supposed to be locally more specific. In fact, there are a lot of other um, contests also um, proposed, uh, specifically uh, spin echo based uh, T2 weighted methods. And we try to see which one works best for us and implement quite a few of them. So every row here refers to one a different contrast mechanism. The top row is the blood volume contrast, VASO. The second row is the conventional gradient echo bold. Then we have a spin echo EPI. And due to the EPI readout, there's quite a lot of unwanted T2 star weighting in there too. So we try to account for this by using, for example, a 
a T2 prep module or even a, T, a diffusion weighted T2 prep module to even get rid of the intravascular uh, bold contrast or a T1 row contrast. And you can see that it's not only the anatomical contrast that looks very different here for the same person, but it's also the functional responses that are quite different depending on which kind of contrast you use. So for some contrasts, for example, the vaso, you might be able to identify striping patterns here, whereas the conventional gradient echo bold is super sensitive, but it's basically a big blob. And the diffusion weighted T2 prep might be super specific. We don't really see the big veins. However, the sensitivity is pretty bad. So we, we end up not seeing anything almost at all. So I tried to summarize the different contrasts by plotting them based on their sensitivity versus specificity. And you can see this kind of unfortunate feature that it's basically following this line. So you can either be sensitive or specific, but not really both at the same time. And the more sensitivity you want to have, the less specificity you get and vice versa. And the only kind of outlayer at this point was this vaso method, which is not the most specific one and certainly not the most sensitive one. It's only as half as sensitive as gradient echo bold, but it gives us some compromise that we can work with. So I think that's the method to beat at least temporarily. And we, we are continuously trying to beat the vaso here. For example, quite recently, uh, in collaboration with David Feinberg, I, I acquired some comparisons of doing vaso with uh, comparing it with 3D grace. And I was quite surprised how specific the 3D grace can also be. It's not as specific as, as vaso, but it's certainly more sensitive. And also quite recently in this publication, I compared vaso with blood flow weighted data that are acquired in Maastricht. Uh, suggesting that blood flow, CBF, can be more specific than vaso. However, you pay a huge price in sensitivity. Can I yes, sure. So why would grace both be more specific than screen echo bold? So I'm supposed to repeat the question. Chef Dan asked the question, why the grace bold is, is so good or better compared to the conventional spin echo? And... Peter asked me this question too. I'm not really sure. Uh, I think here, um, one key point is that this is like a different experiment. It has a different field of view than those directly comparison studies in the same person. So here, the matrix size was tiny. In Grace, you can do this out of um, inner volume selection. So the EPI readout is shorter, so the, the T2 star weighting in the EPI route is, is suppressed. Additionally, Klaus Scheffler at ISMRAM suggested that the grace contrast is not really a T2 contrast, but it's a weird combination of, uh, like you have a lot of stimulated echoes, like a balanced SSFP contrast, where they are, like it's a, it's a complicated contrast mechanism that is not identical to the a T2 or T2 star. It's a weird uh, mixture uh, dependent on the TR and... and um, if it would be in between T2 and T2 star, it should right. be between spin echo and gradient echo bold, but it's just way more specific, it looks like. like it's, I think it's not as specific as, for example, the T2 prep. Um, specificity would be the x-axis here. I don't know. Yeah. It's certainly more specific than the, uh, the spin echo EPI because it has less T2 star weightings in there because of the smaller matrix size. Ah, yeah. Okay. Yes. How did you compute the sensitivity and specificity? <laughs> um, the question is how I computed the sensitivity specificity. So the uh, sensitivity is computed as the uh, set scores in a GLM and the uh, uh, specificity is um, computed as the slope of the, like, the venous bias towards the cortical layers. I have a slide about that I can show you later. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Let's go on then. Uh, the next limitation that I want to talk about is the challenge of how to interpret depth-dependent results with respect to cytoarchitectonically defined like real cortical layers. And the challenge is that like in the, our functional EPI data, we kind of roughly know where CSF starts and where white matter starts, but it's not really clear um, which depth refers to which cytoarchitectonically cortical layers. And um, I try to normalize this, for example, by in my studies, by um, comparing it with landmarks that are visible in MRI and in like the histology. For example, in the primary motor cortex study, um, 
you can calibrate it with postmortem data. So for example, in postmortem cadaver brain samples, you can do 200 micrometer T1 or T2 star maps and compare these like, signatures and landmarks that you see in, for example, T1, where you kind of have this L shape. And we can assign the elbow of this L shape to be coming from layer 5A, from histology or the proton-induced extra emission iron and myelin contents. And then we can try to find these landmarks also in vivo data, for example, in 350 micron um, T1 maps or even in the functional EPI space T1 maps from the T1 contrast in the vaso um, sequence by assigning this elbow of the L shape to be um, coming from layer 5A. And then we can compare everything above layer 5A compared to below fire layer 5A, for example, these two peaks. So we know that kind of these collection of darker voxels in the center here would be somewhere close to layer 5A. And this, of course, needs to be done for every brain area individually. For example, in the um, DLPFC, we kind of have this dip in the cytoarchitectonic um, histology sections between layer three and four, and then we can try to identify these dips also in the EPI T1 maps and compare the like maintenance, manipulation, and uh, output activity with respect to these kind of landmarks. And it is important to note that um, every court brain area has very different layer distributions. So in this slide from Jonathan Polimeni, he summarized the position and the thickness of the respective layers, one to six, across the like, primary areas, primary visual, secondary visual, primary auditory, sensory, and primary motor cortex. And you can see that the layer distribution is very different. So for example, if you are interested in the middle layer, in primary visual cortex, you would end up somewhere in the feed forward layer four. Whereas in the secondary visual cortex, V2, you would end up in the feedback area 3. Or in the motor cortex, you would end up in, in layer 5. So you really need to know where you are in every specific uh, brain area. To calibrate and these estimated cortical depths in the first place, however, we need a good estimation of these cortical depths in the first place, which is also a challenge in layer-dependent fMRI. And there are three competing algorithms about that, the Blastion algorithm, equidistance, and equivolume. And this is just an example um, curvature pattern, for example, from V1. And the different algorithms give quite different like, estimates of cortical layers. So for example, the Lablastian um, algorithm, if you're interested in the middle layer, would calculate the middle layer for like the red line over here. And I think it's maybe the visually most appealing algorithm because it kind of smooths out the cortex in the sense that the middle layer would be closer to CSF at the bottom of a sulcus and closer to a white matter at the, at the crown of a gyrus, whereas equidistance um, is always right in between. And in the equivolume, um, it's not estimating the cortical depth based on Euclidean distance, but based on volume distance in the sense that it's closer, the middle layer would be closer to white matter at the bottom of a sulcus and closer to CSF at the crown of a gyrus. And we can easily see which one is right by overlaying them with these very high resolution, openly available 200 micron flash data ex vivo, where you might be able to see this dark stripe here suggesting the tree of Genari. And you can see that the Lablastian algorithm is super wrong. So the, the dark layer should really go close to white matter at the bottom of a, of a sulcus, and the, the red layer is just, yeah, wrong. Equidistance is not so wrong, but the best one is really the equivolume um, approach, where it really captures how deep the Street of Genari is at the bottom of a sulcus, and, and so on. And this is only particularly important at this very, very high resolution. So in my experience with more realistic fMRI resolutions of 0.75 millimeters, I don't really see a huge difference for equivolume and equidistance. Maybe only at the positions where there is a huge curvature going on, then it might blur things a bit more. I think equidistant is kind of okay, equivolume is better, you should never use Laplacian. The challenge uh, the next challenge that I want to talk about is the challenge of statistical interpretability of the signal across cortical depth. And the challenge comes from the fact that uh, uh, baseline vascular um, physiology is heterogeneous across cortical depth. So for example, we know that uh, the upper layers have more baseline blood volume compared to the deeper layers. This means that they also have larger physiological noise or a different weighting between physiological and thermal noise um, compared to the deeper layers. 
um, as seen, for example, in the TSNR maps, meaning that it really makes a difference on how you analyze your data. If you do it quantitatively in like, physical units of milliliter per tissue uh, volume in, in blood volume fMRI or percent blood volume or um, statistical set scores, because the noise is different across the cortical layers. And this might be clearer if you focus on the upper layers here in the motor cortex and um, going through the different contrasts. So this would be statistical absolute um, I'm getting there. Statistical relative absolute, statistical relative absolute, statistical relative absolute. So you see that for the statistical one, it's mostly the deeper layers, that the upper layer is really suppressed. And uh, this means that as soon as you use a different sequence, which is better, or go to a new scanner, your profiles would look different because your noise is different. And this is um, this critique about not using statistical um, measures as a measure of um, brain activity is my personal opinion, and I really feel like that guy like running against the trend because a lot of people um, base their neuroscience uh, interpretations based on set scores, t scores, or and the correlation values, where it's very hard to interpret if um, the shift of a certain cortical depth peak to from here to here comes from the fact that they have, uh, like the signal is larger here compared to here, or if it's just the noise that is higher here compared to here. The next challenge that I want to talk about is the application of um, general linear models in combination with uh, predefined canonical uh, hemodynamic response function. So usually in fMRI, you kind of assume a canonical HRF, convolve it with your task design, and then compare the time course with every voxel. And in layer-dependent fMRI, we don't really have a good model about the uh, HRFs across the different depths. In fact, we know that the vessels have different response times across cortical depths. So for example, if the upper layer and deeper layer have the same neural onset, it can happen that the lower layer is much faster in the HRF, in, in fMRI, uh, compared to the upper layers, independent of the branch size. Meaning that if you assume a certain HRF, you might bias your, your results towards upper and deeper layers. And I want to make this clearer by showing you this example of flipping back and forth an early response and a later response of a 30-second um, finger tapping trial. So if you focus on the deeper layer, you see that the deeper layer really only comes up in the later part of the task because they do have different hemodynamic response functions. Um, meaning that if you have shorter trials, you might end up seeing a, a layer profile like the blue one. Or if you assume a canonical HRF that has an overshoot and undershoot, you're really biasing your results to the blue profile, whereas actually after you reach a steady state, it might look more like the red one here. So that's a limit in layer fMRI. Why do you think that is? Um, why, why do you think there is a difference? Is that at a capillary level, or is that at a lower level? Or it's hard to say. <laughs> I think it's a mixture of, of everything. Okay. So, so I'm comparing it with opto, like optical. We did this experiments with in rats. Sorry, I repeat the question. Um, the, the question was uh, where this difference in the hemodynamic response function is coming from. And my personal um, suspicion is that it's a mixture of the different um, uh, compartments of the vasculature. So in, in rats with optical imaging, we found that uh, um, arteries, the actively controlled part of the vascular, reacts much faster compared to the more passively downstream part, for example, the cap capillaries. Even though it is shown that the capillaries have a um, faster response time, they actually, uh, before they really peak at the end, it takes much longer. So um, I found that the longer my trial is and the longer I wait after um, stimulus onset, the more locally specific my results get. So, so it's kind of the downstream passively controlled part of the vasculature is the more sp locally specific one. But arterioles have also active control, right? They need some capillaries there. Right. Right. Even the, like the bigger ones, the, the, the diving ones, they, right. And, and uh, those are the fast ones, I believe. Those are the, the ones that have these overshoot, the, uh, the, the ones that are uh, specifically in the upper layers. But you don't think that is peel arteries? In rats, I do see peel arteries also dilating a bit, yeah. yeah. Uh, the next challenge that I want to talk about is the fact of the venous leakage and how to uh, correct for that. And I uh, talked about this a bit already, um, comparing these blood volume and bold results, where I showed you that the blood volume results are kind of more um, like 
clearer. You see these peaks of different um, depth-dependent activity, whereas the bolt has these bias towards the upper cortical layers. And we know where this is coming from. This comes from the fact that the veins are just strained towards the upper layer. So the activity up here basically reflects the um, a weighted integral of the activity within that layer plus all the layers below. And a lot of groups are working on methods in um, describing, param parametrizing, and accounting for this. For example, uh, Jakob Heinzle uses this dynamic model where he says that the activity in a future time point in the upper layer is always a weighted sum of the current activity within that layer plus the, plus the past activity in the deeper layer, dependent on like leach leakage factors lambda here. Irati Makuerikiaka has a similar model, um, more looking at the steady state, where she also assumes that every layer um, is basically a weighted sum of the um, activity within that layer plus an integral of all the layers below. And Martin Havlicek and Kamil Uluda even have a more sophisticated model about intra and extravascular bolt components with, from the microvasculature and macrovasculature. And as important these models are to understand these biases, I'm still uh, skeptical on how useful they are to invert, to be inverted and basically correct um, the, the vascular bias in the sense that we don't really have good model parameters. For example, uh, a voxel up here obviously has a very different leakage factor compared to a voxel up here where no big draining vein is going through. And I want to make this clearer by um, showing you two. Um, ah, there it is. Sorry. Um, this, I want to show you two columns here from the primary motor cortex, um, like this column and that column, which have slightly different baseline vasculature, like different baseline uh, vessel density. And if I apply these um, like vasculature mo um, parameters, put them into my model, invert the model, I end up with very uh, different uh, corrected layer-dependent profiles in the sense that when you um, have a small error in your model parameters, for example, you overestimate your blood volume or your leakage, then you really overestimate your um, leakage in the results. What I mean, mean to say is that you actually in introduce more variance in the final results. They become less interpretable and uh, dependent on, on your, uh, the knowledge you have about every voxel and the leakage within that voxel. The next challenge that I want to talk about refers to the to acquisition challenges in brain areas that are particularly thin. Um, for example, the primary visual cortex, which I am struggling with and trying constantly since many years now. And the reason why it's so challenging is because it only has half the thickness compared to the motor cortex. And these are some, are some results that are acquired together with Yusin Gönze in, in Monkeys, where we looked at different um, resolution voxel sizes for a, a rotating um, checkerboard stimulus. And I'm starting with 1.2 and going higher in the resolution. And first you see this basically this arc, the cortex, uh, V1 of the monkey. And at some point you see this bifurcation where you start to separate not one arc, but basically two arc, an upper layer and a deeper layer. And this may be even clearer in the profiles where you see you need about 0 0.6, 0 0.5 millimeter resolution to really be able to separate with Nyquist sampling the upper and deeper layers. And it's not, we are not really there yet to do 0.5 millimeter isotropic in humans, whereas 0.8 millimeter was completely enough for the motor cortex. And I believe that even though we cannot really separate upper from deeper layers with Nyquist sampling, it can, VASO can still help here in the sense that um, you can isolate, for example, the deeper layers um, because you're not so sensitive to the big veins in the first place. So here I'm flipping back and forth bold and vaso, and you can see that vaso is kind of more sensitive to the deeper layers and outlines the cortical ribbon better than the gradient echo bold. And Eli, Miriam, and, and Svi um, are doing some very exciting things with vaso at very high resolution, for example, looking at the uh, a biological point spread function here in the primary visual cortex and finding that VASO can really be specific in order um, to identify these rings of rot rotating flickering checkerboards um, by the distance of uh, one or two voxels here. The next challenge that I want to talk about is the a challenge of the unknown variability across the columns. So I showed you this example now several times already where we see these different modulations of the layer-dependent activity for like tapping with touch or touch only. 
However, if you look at it more carefully, you can see it's only this tiny part of the hand knob that is reacting like that. If we move just a few millimeters to the left, it already looks pretty different, and we don't see this um, like different behavior. So I found it's very helpful to really know where you are with respect to the columns. And it's, I found it important that to really understand what the layers are doing, you need to also know what the layers, what the columns are doing and how the distribution is across the columns. And I'm working on this recently, uh, trying to uh, tease apart layers and columns at the same time. So I'm trying to show you three slides about this here too. Basically, the aim is to develop tools that can investigate layers and columnar uh, representations at the same time, something like this theodolite that allows us to investigate columnar and laminar features at the same time. And a very easy test bed to like, debug these kind of tools is this stripe of the primary motor cortex, where we roughly know that the different body parts are aligned in this kind of linear fashion. And we can go to smaller and smaller body parts, for example, by looking at um, like smaller and smaller columns. And here I'm showing you examples of individual finger tapping tasks. And in order to get towards these columns, we not only know, need to know the cortical depth metrics, but we also need to know something like a cortical distance. And in order to get there, I'm using this kind of crawler algorithm, basically picking a seed region and then telling the algorithm to grow along similar T1 values directly in the functional EPI data until the whole kind of cortical surface within the field of view is covered, giving us a nice Euclidean distance, distance metric. And in order to show you how this looks in real life data, I want to show you this example here, where it's, you can see a kind of axial view where the motor cortex is on the right side here. You can see how thick it is. And the sensory cortex is on the left side here. Where you can see how thin it is. And this crawler algorithm then basically um, spans surfaces in the third dimension here. So for sensory cortex, and this would be the motor cortex. And then we can look at the protection from any side. So for example, this would be a view where we look at the um, sensory cortex from the back of the brain. And then we can protect the individual fingers onto it. This would be the representation for the pinky finger, ring finger, middle finger, index finger, and thumb. We can see this kind of stripy alignment across the layers. And I was surprised to see how big it is. It's like 30% of the entire central sulk seems to be responsible for the fingers only. More interesting, however, is then the motor side. So when I, I flip this around, which is going to happen any second now, then um, you see this kind of cave here, which would be the, the hand knob. And again, I can project the individual fingers onto it, starting from the pinky finger, ring finger, middle finger, index finger, and thumb. But you can see these very interesting patterns that it's not so linear like in the, in the sensory cortex, but we have these mirrored patterns of red, green, yellow, blue, pink, red, green, yellow, blue, pink. So I wonder what I want to say here with respect to layers is that you really need to know uh, which kind of finger you're looking at, which kind of column you're looking at to really good uh, interpret your, your cortical layer results too. The next challenge that I want to talk about is the challenge with respect to the coverage limitation at high resolution. So at high resolution, we have a lot of voxels, which takes some time to acquire. Um, so usually the coverage is, is kind of limited. And in fact, in this study that I showed you with the different finger tappings, we only covered a tiny part of the, of the brain, not even 1% of whole brain coverage, just the motor cortex, which was everything we needed in that study, but it's not very practical for neuroscience. Uh, so we are con constantly working on it to improve the coverage. And for example, the last results that I showed you with the individual finger representations, we could increase it to 14% already. And even though this is not a lot yet, going from here to here is, is, is a huge leap for me. Like it's a factor of 20. The remaining part is only a factor of seven. So we might get there at some point too, especially specifically um, when we consider that the slab thickness here is approaching the size of the radio frequency hardware, meaning that we can do much more efficient accelerations in, in both phase encoding directions here. So for example, with uh, Kuiperinia, we are getting towards good SNRs for about half of brain coverage, where we uh, just have, en have enough SNR to exceed the detection threshold. And we need to work um, more on this to, to get it more robustly and, and larger coverages. The next challenge that I found hard in layer fMRI is the intersubject stability. And I'm not really sure if it's a unique challenge of, of high-resolution fMRI, 
or a general fMRI, but you really uh, are limited more by it in, in, in layer-dependent fMRI because every person looks different at these submillimeter resolutions. So you need to do an analysis for every person differently. Um, and so um, I really have the experience that some people work awesomely well repeatedly, and for some other people, it's just much harder. For example, here, two per people doing the same task, and in the area of the index finger, in the motor cortex here, I see that one person has like 10% bold signal change in the upper layers, and it's not even really exceeding the detection threshold in the deeper layers. Whereas another person maybe has 5% bold signal change, and only a little small activity in the deeper layers. And it's very hard or for me, or I think the whole field doesn't really know where this is coming from. There could be a lot of different factors. For example, it could be that this person is just less sporty or drank coffee before the scan, so it has a different venous baseline oxygenation that affects and scales the bowl differently across cortical depth. And I believe we can try to account for this in the future by using more quantitative contrasts. For example, here in those two people, when I look at the vaso, you can see it's kind of more reproducible because vaso is not so sensitive to venous baseline oxygenation changes, for example. The next challenge, or I think the last challenge that I want to talk about is a challenge with respect to the interconnectivity across layers. And I want to explain this with this example here. So let's consider we have an, a, like a canonical microcircuitry, like a granular, granular cortex, like the primary visual cortex. We, most layer-dependent fMRI researchers assume that we have input, feed-forward input into the middle layers and feedback input into upper and or deeper layers. But actually, there's so much more going on. In fact, even before the feedback comes into play, the within layer connectivity um, activates the upper layers, which then within a few milliseconds activates the deeper layers. So there's a lot of connectivity going on. And I get the question a lot that how the hell should we be able to differentiate the layers if everything is connected and everything becomes active anyway? And I believe there are two ways of thinking about this. The, the first thing is um, looking at the magnitude. For example, when we look at uh, electrophysiological results, we know that like, first it's the middle layer that receives the input. Like 30 seconds, milliseconds later, it's the upper layers and the deeper layers. But when you look at the magnitude, you see that the, like, the first input that comes into that area is like, an order of magnitude bigger than these like, secondary um, orders. Secondly, I think it's important to consider that only because we have all these connections within layers doesn't mean that they are necessar necessarily engaged. And this kind of um, interpretation limit with respect to faster neural connectivity compared to fMRI connectivity is not specific to layer fMRI. Uh, in conventional fMRI, we have the same issue. We know that every area is connected with every other area. And still, so, so, so you could also ask, how on earth can we do fMRI um, to identify individual areas when every area like, activates every other area anyway? And the answer, of course, is that it really depends on the contrast and if these connections are engaged or not. And I want to make this even clearer by looking at um, an example that I recently um, investigated, for example, looking at feed forward from LGN to V1 and then from V1 to V5 MT. And it really depends on the contrast that you're using. For example, um, if you have a star field that is moving or not, V1 doesn't really care so much if it's moving or not. It always becomes active. This doesn't mean that always V5 needs to become active, only if the, the contrast is right. So for example, V5 here only cares about the movement, not so much about the static um, luminosity changes of the static um, star field over here. And I guess this way of thinking can be transferred to layers too, in the sense that we can identify different feed forward or feedback input from monkeys that are naive or trained monkeys, which do have different feed forward and feedback input, even though everything is connected to everything. So I talked a lot about the limits that I'm struggling with and that are somewhat addressable, um, but they are also completely open questions. For example, um, even though layer-dependent fMRI is getting very popular, um, to really be um, take off and, and be applicable in neuroscience, we need to work on better analysis pipelines. It needs to be um, like a turnkey push-button basis methods, and then we need to work on this more. Also, it's still unknown what the uh, ultimate physiological uh, spatial specificity is. So in all the um, like animal studies that I found online, it's mostly they're, uh, they're mostly describing that the uh, 
blood flow control is as specific as their resolution, as the voxel size. So I think we are still not really there yet. It, it seems that the vascular blood flow control is, is very, very specific. And it's also not clear what the ultimate imaging resolution will be and um, in which area we should focus on more to, to push that. For example, should we focus more on better contrasts, better sequences? Should we more focus on the, on the hardware, like better gradients or, or RF coils or bigger magnets? Or if it's, is it a weighted combination of all of those? That's also not really clear. If you're interested in further material um, about layer-dependent fMRI, I would recommend to you this special issue in NeuroImage, where most of the articles are already available and in this early preview. And I think the whole issue is coming out any week now. Uh, a while back, I started this Google Docs about all the layer-dependent fMRI papers in humans, and it has, has taken off from there. A lot of people are um, completing that list, and there are summaries about every single layer-dependent fMRI paper, mostly with a focus on humans, though. And if you want to be kept up to date, you can check out my blog and my Twitter feed. And with that, I want to thank all my colleagues here at NIH and overseas, and I thank you for your attention. Are there any questions? Can you comment a little bit on perfusion imaging? So perfusion is also locally quite specific. Right. Um, so in base there can be some perfusion contribution. Have you tried to minimize it or maximize it in your treatment? Mm. Uh, maybe first, uh, sorry, the question was um, if I could elaborate on perfusion, um, if it's, uh, since it also has been proposed to be very specific, and uh, the second part of the question was um, how much vaso is um, contaminated by additional perfusion artifacts. Or enhanced. Or enhanced. <laughs> um, so maybe the, the second question first then. Um, Yes, VASO does have some uh, perfusion contamination, especially with these long readouts that I uh, need to use here for the um, high resolution, meaning that I am not really getting at to the blood nulling time in VASO always. Um, right now, I don't really care so much in, in the way that um, whatever works. So if it's more specific than bold, and if I get rid of the big, large training veins, then I'm, I'm happy enough. If it's like, like blood volume only or perfusion, um, would be, become more important when like, you, you want to put a physical unit to it and, for example, calibrate it with... If it were for solution, maybe you can optimize more towards the solution, right? Right. Do you, right. Uh, you have an idea? So if you would eliminate the perfusion contribution hmm. or, or minimize it, hmm. would the results get better? Or it's complicated. Like there are different perfusion uh, contaminations in there. For example, in VASO, we try to invert everything, and then with the head transmit coil available, there might be perfusion contamination of inflowing fresh blood, and there might be perfusion effects from the permeable capillary walls that um, now blood is getting into the extravascular space, and they're decaying with uh, um, gray matter T1. And um, the f uh, second contrast mechanism would help me. So that would mean that um, longer inversion times would would um, enhance the perfusion contrast, and we should like push that. That the first um, um, contrast mechanism is actually hurting me quite a bit. Yeah, right, it suppresses. So um, I found, like I, I played uh, with a huge range of inversion times, and we want to have reasonable TRs at the end. So uh, I, yeah. I find that, like, when I, mean, I look at the signal change across um, inversion times, it like as soon as I have a stable signal, it doesn't change a lot. Um, the perfusion, like, um, you asked about the blood flow um, experiments, and I find that VASO is uh, much more beneficial at high resolution, at high fields, because you're basically inverting the blood within the slice, blood the plus the blood that is flowing in. So you don't need to have this bolus below and it's a seven Tesla without PTX or without uh, transmit coils. It's very hard to get a decent bolus in ASL and in VASO we are not suffering from that. Yeah. Yeah. Are there other questions? Yes, thank you. 
probably have already pushed your consciousness in English. I feel the limit already. But uh, as far as I know, the Bezo is going to become stronger when you shorten your echo time. Is there any sign? Right. So the question was about uh, sequence limits uh, at these high resolutions. Uh, yes, I can confirm I'm really trying to push the, the hardware and the sequence to its limits. And right now, I think the echo time is, um, like VASO is not so much limited by echo time right now because I need to acquire VASO and Bolt like interleaved anyway. So I know my Bolt contamination in VASO and can subtract that out. So if I have longer echo times, I don't really care so much about it. I am limited by echo time, and mostly because we have these huge bulky body gradients that we use for head imaging. So we are uh, really limited by speed. So um, I try to like keep my echo time as short as possible anyway, not only to optimize the VASO contrast, but to acquire the high resolution, the large matrix sizes within a reasonable time before it completely decays away. So, um, it, to the VASO contrast, not, not. To the resolution, yes, very much. We are really limited by echo time. For example, with a head gradient coil, um, you could have shorter echo times, better echo spacing, further away from these um, acoustic resonances that actually Krappa works robustly too. So I would really benefit from shorter echo time, independent of VASO. If there are no more questions, thank you again.